borrowing this much under such exorbitant terms and conditions. It is also entirely possible that this unbridled borrowing binge is partly motivated by the fact that the personal fortunes of the finance minister and other regime actors have been significantly enhanced with the tens of millions of Ghanaian CDs that have accrued in their private firms as transaction advisory fees for all the bond issuances. Whatever the case may be, this appetite for borrowing has proven catastrophic for our economy and has done real damage. It is well known to be an uncanny desire to kick the can down the road in the hope that it will end up at the feet of a new administration that will take over from them in 2025. The current path of reckless borrowing and piling on of debt has been discredited and cannot lead us anywhere except economic ruin and bankruptcy. Indeed, this current finance minister is on record to have said very clearly that you cannot borrow your way out of debt. These are his own words. And yet, when the circumstances uh, gave him the opportunity, that's exactly what he's doing. This government must act now and seek help to avert imminent national catastrophe. Ghanaians did not hand over the reins of power to President Akubwado to crash the ship of state through empty pride and challenges facing our nation today. Let me commend Seth, Mr. Seth Tepe, my former finance minister, for the technical presentation that he, he made, which has highlighted some of the key issues at stake that we need to look at. And it has set the tone for some of the issues I'll be touching on in these, I don't know whether they are brief remarks, but let me say brief remarks. Um, for many who are not economic students, it might have been difficult to follow uh, Seth's presentation. But I've been a student for a very long time, not in school, but a lot of the economics I know, I learned from Seth. And so I'm able to decipher his tables and pick out the grains of knowledge that he espouses. And I think that in the presentation he made, he talked about many things, including trying to slow down the rate of debt accumulation by smart borrowing and refinancing high interest uh, debt that we, we had on our books. He also talked about the buffers we created. Every economy needs buffers so that when you get into turbulent winds, you are not as affected as you should be. Unfortunately, this government destroyed all those buffers, and that is why when we got into the turbulence of COVID, and now they've added Ukraine and Russia, they have no uh, shock absorbers to be able to withstand the turbulence that is happening. We also talked significantly about the collateralization of all sources of revenue, and it's affecting them because those revenues are no longer available. They've taken them up front and spent them. But the more important thing is the effect it will have on our future and future governments. For instance, ESLA, till 2035. It means that governments between now and 2035 are not going to have access to any extra ESLA uh, rev rev revenues. And those are get fund, you know. They've used it to float a bond. And so they themselves and future governments, you know, would not have access to uh, get fund uh, revenues. And that is why I said the other time, when the TUC asked that he should take some of the taxes off. I said some of the taxes, they can't take off because they've collected the money and spent it up front. And so they're going to be part of our petroleum price buildup until the period for which they've been collateralized. Ladies and gentlemen, early last month I spoke at an event dubbed Ghana at the crossroads. And I drew attention to the serious mismanagement that has plunged our dear country, Ghana, into the most debilitating economic crisis in the last 40 years or so. I called on President Akufuado and his head of economic management team to end the nonchalance and indecisiveness and take urgent steps to address the self-inflicted economic disaster that has brought unbearable economic hardship, pain, and great suffering to the people of Ghana. I made it clear that the economic problems we are facing 
stem from imprudent election-related expenditure and reckless decision-making in the management of the economy. For instance, the banking sector clean-out and the debt they inflicted on the economy, almost $22 billion for really no reason, when you could have resolved the banking sector uh, crisis with less uh, injection of capital. And it's been done before. When Lloyds Bank was collapsing, the British government intervened and took equity in Lloyds Bank. Today, Lloyds Bank is one of the strongest banks. They've paid back everything the government gave them and taken their equity back. Then you... So I made it clear that the economic problems we're facing stem from imprudent election-related expenditure and reckless decision-making in the management of the economy. This also includes the way the windfall from COVID was used. As a result of COVID, COVID was an adversity, but in adversity is opportunity. As a result of COVID, multilateral institutions gave us money. We took extra money from the Bank of Ghana and just misused it. That money would have cushioned, you know, this crisis that we're going through. I highlighted the unsustainable public debts, large fiscal deficits, rising inflation, a rapidly depreciating currency, spiraling cost of doing uh, business, ever rising cost of living, high levels of corruption, and a general loss of investor confidence as the present issues affecting the economy, which require immediate action and resolution. I then proceeded to give some policy options that could be adopted by the government to bring the economy back on track and reverse the precipitous decline that we are experiencing. The Akufuado Baumia government has so far failed to demonstrate that it has a plan to resolve the economic crisis and has not heeded suggestions made in that regard. The policy intransigence has proven very costly and has spawned a significant deterioration in the already terrible economic situation of Ghanaians in the intervening weeks since I gave that address. At the macro level, almost all the key indices like inflation, debt levels, debt to GDP ratio, exchange rates, fiscal deficit, primary balance, gross financing needs, gross and net international reserves, amongst others, have all worsened sending the economy into a dizzying tailspin. Available data from the first quarter economic outturns published by government shows that the fiscal deficit target for the first quarter of 2022 has been missed, with a deficit of 2.6% recorded instead of the program 2.2%. The trend suggests that similar numbers are to be expected for subsequent quarters which will, in our estimation, lead to an end-of-year fiscal deficit of above 10%. The exchange rate has, been, has seen further depreciation, with the dollar now exchanging at over 8 CDs, uh, uh, eight CDs on the forex market. And this is attributable to capital flights associated with the withdrawal of non-resident investors from our economy due to their loss of confidence in the economic management. The share of holdings in domestic bonds by non-resident investors has fallen steeply from 35% to 15% by the first quarter of this year. Inflation has accelerated to 27.6% in May from 19.4% in March and is expected to inch up in the coming months. This puts Ghana as one of the African countries with the highest inflation rates so far. The public debt has exceeded 400 billion Ghana cities. If debt stocks on the books of some SPVs and statutory funds, which gov this government seeks to exclude are factored in, we owe more than 400 billion cities. And so this translates into a debt to GDP ratio of over 80%, well beyond the red line of 70% at which lower middle income countries are declared as debt distressed. Indeed, Ghana has been identified as one of the debt distressed countries already. Multiple international financial institutions continue to rank Ghana among countries that are likely to end up like Sri Lanka and default on their debt repayments if urgent action is not taken. 
We still have the worst credit ratings in the over 20 year rating history of this country, while we remain firmly shut out of the international capital market. On the micro front, the parlor state of the economy is sending shockwaves through households with ever increasing prices of goods and services which have made the cost of living simply too high for the average Ghanaian. Food prices have shot up astronomically and our people cannot afford three square meals a day. Indeed, I hear of some new form formulas, 010 or 100 zero zero or 001. Zero so some people cannot even afford more than one meal a day. <laughs> okay, somebody said that zero zero zero. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have any money, you can't eat. <laughs> Fuel prices remain at their highest level ever amid nearly weekly increases in the price of the commodity. In turn, transport operators continue to slap increments on transport costs, and this continues to affect the price of items on a daily basis. Government itself is struggling to meet its financial commitment in all sectors of the economy. At the center of this problem is the debt burden. The debt position and the debt servicing obligations arising from same are literally draining the very lifeblood of our economy and have formed a powerful vortex into which virtually all our revenues are being sucked. In the last few years, our debt service obligations have swallowed an inordinately large proportion of our revenue, leaving very little fund for all the other expenditure commitments that government has to make. An examination of government's own economic data for the first quarter of this year reveals a very troubling exacerbation of these fiscal rigidities. Instead of taking the boom by the horn and addressing the root causes of the economic meltdown, government opted to place their hopes in misguided revenue projections and regressive tax measures such as the infamous e-levy. The e-levy was presented as the panacea of the economic problems of Ghana. Indeed, it was said that it will solve everything it will do our roads, build our hospitals, give fertilizer to farmers. The e-levy was like the magic wand. We are in fact told that if we pass e-levy, it will help governments to reduce borrowing. True to our predictions and our cautions to governments about the overly ambitious revenue and fiscal projections, available first quarter data shows that those targets will not be met. And this, no doubt, will create even bigger credibility crisis for our battered economy. For the entire month of May, figures available to me of the much vaunted E-11, which was rammed down the throats of Ghanaians, yielded a paltry 54 million Ghana cities against a target of 474 million for that month, representing only 11.3%. And so the unofficial Prime Minister was right when he said they are making just about 10% of what they expected. The month of June has not offered any sign of improvement, as only about 7.1 million had been collected by the first week of the month. By the first week of June, only 7.1 million had, had come in. These figures demonstrate that so far the E-Levy has been a spectacular failure and has become the mother of all nuisance taxes. And as you know, a recent survey showed that 80% of Ghanaians who use mobile money have adapted their behavior to avoid the tax. More people are cashing out from their wallets to make cash payments instead of transferring wallet to wallet where the tax is, is imposed. We've therefore retrogressed in our bid to make Ghana the cashless society that we have all been hoping for. Whereas total tax revenues of 14.6 billion was projected to be collected for the first quarter of this year, that's in the 2022 budget, 12, only 12.8 billion was collected. So there was a shortfall. The budget projected that in the first quarter they will collect 14.6 billion, but they collected 12.8 billion. 
Now, this amount was not enough to meet the debt service payment for the same period, which stood at 13.9 billion. So it means for the debts that we owe, the debt service obligation for the first quarter is 13.9 billion. And all our revenue that was collected in the first quarter was 12.8 billion. So it means all that revenue is going to pay the debt. Even more, <laughs> you need some extra. So where do you get money for wages? Where do you get money for all the other expenditures that government has to make? In other words, all the taxes collected by government in the first quarter of this year was less than the total amount paid in interest on our debt, which stood at 10.6 billion and amortization of 3.3 billion. So if you add the two, you get the 13 point something billion that I talked about. Expressed in percentage terms, total debt service for the first quarter of this year was equal to 108% of all taxes that government collected in this period. So more than 100% of the taxes went into uh, debt interest payments and amortization. This is the reason why government is unable to provide textbooks and other teaching materials for our school children. And it's the region, reason why government has rigged up huge arrears to statutory funds, like the NHIS, District Assemblies Common Fund, and Get Fund, among others. Out of the 1.3 billion that government budgeted in the 2022 budget to pay domestic contractors in the first quarter of this year, only 38 million Ghana CDs was paid, while absolutely nothing was paid out of the 255 million that was budgeted for arrears, arrears clearance in the first quarter of 2022. And yet more arrears are being accumulated uh, uh, since the beginning of this year. Ghanaian businesses have borne the brunt of this and are suffocating under the yoke of huge debts that are owed to them by government. Fertilizer supplies, for instance, have been owed 485 million Ghana cities since 2020. And that has hampered their ability to continue to supply fertilizer to farmers, which is vital for agriculture and food production. No wonder the price of uh, food, uh, food continues to go up. Because as I speak, a bag of urea fertilizer is more than 400 cities. Last year, it was a little over 200 cities. And so how many farmers can afford to buy uh, fertilizer for, for their farms? The list of other creditors whose local businesses have been severely crippled as a result is endless. It is now beyond debate that we currently find ourselves in an almost hopeless situation which we will remain in until very drastic and far-reaching steps are taken to get out of this mess. This is devastating news for any economy, let alone one plagued with the deep-seated problems that we have. It is apparent that even as the ship, ship of state is being buffeted by the choppy waters of economic disaster, President Akufuado and his head of the economic management team and his finance minister have no clue in what direction to lead this country. They have dug their heels in, remained obstinate, and have become totally impervious to sound proposals to rescue the economy and mitigate the extreme economic hardships that Ghanaians are grappling with. They have simply refused to do what is necessary to arrest the decline. The suffering and pain experienced by Ghanaians do not seem enough to jolt the Akufuado Baumia government into action. They remain tone deaf and dead set in the very misguided ways that have brought us to our knees as a country. Somehow, they have, they have convinced themselves that by refusing to do the heavy lifting required, they can wait out the economic storm and that stability and normalcy will return as a matter of due course. The most that people of Ghana have been giving are inspired rhetoric, denials, and a litany of unconvincing excuses as to about how we came to this painful juncture as a nation. Talk and promises of expenditure cuts and prudence in the management of public funds remain a fantasy 
with no practical demonstration of any commitment to same. Indeed, how can you do expenditure cuts when you don't even have the money to finance the expenditure? It's not there already. So if you are cutting expenditure by 30%, you already don't have that money to cut. In the midst of the national anguish and despair, this government finds it necessary to double in mind-boggling waste of every scarce public fund on frivolous and extravagant expenditures that hold no immediate tangible or beneficial outcomes for our nation. And I'm sure you all know examples of them. On a daily basis, more evidence emerges of the systematic assault on the public purse and endemic corruption. The President continues to place his personal creature comforts above the need for modesty and prudence, especially at this time, by continuing to press ahead with the rental of ultra-expensive jets for foreign trips that our presidential aircraft could have ferried him comfortably to execute with more cost-effective options. Where still, this government and its officials continue to treat the people of Ghana with utter contempt and impunity by refusing to account for the utilization of public funds, even when such demands are made by Parliament. Parliament actually had to drag the Minister of Finance by the ear to come and answer a few questions. A case in point is the resistance mounted by this government against accounting for the use of COVID-19 funds, despite several calls for same to be done, including through parliamentary questions, until a threat by the Speaker to block all the business of the Finance Ministry in the House finally compelled the Minister to show up. That's why I said he was dragged by the ear. Contrary to expectations that they will at least end the practices that have put us in this mess, they seem determined and are relentless in their bid to worsen our plight. In my address last month, I called for the immediate placement of a moratorium on new non-concessionary borrowing as a way of halting the rapid rise of the public debt beyond unsustainable levels. I suggested that this government should immediately enter negotiations with our multilateral partners with a view to engaging our creditors to restructure our debt and ease, ease the debt service bed, burden in order to offer as desperately needed respite, even as corrective measures are applied to our seriously ailing economy. This government has shown no inclination towards doing this, despite not having any clear plan to deal with the problem. The lack of a credible plan has led to the resort to even more borrowing as the public debt gets out of hand and wreaks havoc on our finances. The very limited options that we have in view of the messed up state of our economy means that any further borrowing would be very expensive and detrimental to our interests. It is little wonder that last week the finance minister took a very inimical one billion dollar syndicated loan to Parliament for consideration and approval. The loan is made up of 250 million from a consortium of banks comprising uh, Standard Chartered, another uh, run merchant bank, and Standard Bank of South Africa. And they also took a 750 million component from Afri Exim Bank. These combined one billion will have great implications for our economy if it's approved. The terms of this loan are extremely unfavorable and cannot be in the interest of the Ghanaian people for the following reasons. One, to begin with, it will add a colossal 8 billion Ghana cities to our debt, which is already above 400 billion. The cost of insurance alone for the $250 million insurance alone is $40.6 million. The total interest payable and other costs on this $250 million loan, which has a five-year tenor, amounts to $86.85 million. So if we take $250 million, we will insure by $40 million. By the time we pay in five years' time, we would have paid $86 million of, of the, of the $250 million. The total cost, therefore, 
for borrowing the 250 million components amounts to 127.5 million. For the 750 million component, this is the AFRIEXIM one, interest payments and other costs, excluding insurance premium and or collateral, come up to about 383 million over a seven year tenor. And so we're taking 750 million over a seven year tenor. We're taking 750 million. By the time we finish paying, 383 million would have been paid as interest and other charges. So put together, that's the 250 and the 750. The 1 billion loan agreement will cost the taxpayer 351 million in interest and other charges. The repayment schedules for both components mean that this government will be saddling any new government that comes. That replaces it with an additional 1.438 billion to pay within five to seven years, starting from the first quarter of 2025. That's the thing about this loan. Repayment starts in 2025. And that's the thing about this government. Spend today and leave the problem to whoever will come after. Added to the total of 2.775 billion in 2025 and 2026 uh, euro bonds, the next government will have to cough up about $3 billion while the current exchange rate 24 billion CDs within 15 months of taking office just to retire and service four loan items. The three billion needed for this will virtually wipe out our net international reserves, which will seriously undermine the economy. In the four years between 2025 and 2029, 3.7 billion or, uh, dollars or approximately 30 billion Ghana cities will be required to retire maturing euro bonds alone. And so it shows the uh, challenge that um, whichever administration takes over is going to have to face because of the reckless, you know, borrowing and attitude of the current administration. This will be in addition to the tens of billions of CDs in debt service payment for other loans that will, will have to be paid from 2025 onwards. Unlike the situation in 2017, where we had a very visionary government and a very capable finance minister. This current government in 2017 inherited a sinking fund set up under the NDC with over $200 million in it. As he explained, the sinking fund, you put some money in to make for a rainy day. If a debt becomes due, you don't now have to go running to look for money. You just take out of the sinking fund and pay. And we knew that the Kufo Euro bond was due for payment in September the next year. And so he left some money in the sinking fund. And so when the new administration came, they just took money from there and paid off the Kufo Euro bond. That is not going to be the case with the next administration. This administration is bent on spending everything and even leaving collateralized uh, 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 funds to the next administration. And as I said, even worse is the fact that this government has collateralized almost all revenue streams and is seeking to collateralize more, including our gold royalties, under the dubious EJAPA deal. In view of the above, we in the NDC cannot lend support to the one billion syndicated loan agreement, and our MPs are poised to oppose and vote against it in Parliament. One of the rationales given for seeking the loan is the need for foreign exchange to show up our reserves, which have dwindled considerably in the last few months. This government knows that the wisest thing to do in these circumstances is to improve our reserve position, and that is to seek balance of payment support from multilateral institutions like the IMF. Because this, this balance of payment support will come at concessionary rates and at very minimal cost. That are certainly nowhere near the astronomical and prohibitive cost that, they are, uh, uh, that is associated with this syndicated one, one billion loan. We wish to serve notice going forward that the NDC in Parliament will not support any further non-concessionary borrowing or loans that are not project specific 
with clear and unambiguous terms of the benefit to our nation. We will not partake in the destruction of the Ghanaian economy, which this government appears so bent on doing. Perhaps the knowledge by President Akufuado and his head of the economic management team and his finance minister that they will not be in government in the very near future to carry this debt burden has emboldened them to act so irresponsibly by borrowing this much under such exorbitant terms and conditions. It is also entirely possible that this unbridled borrowing binge is partly motivated by the fact that the personal fortunes of the finance minister and other regime actors have been significantly enhanced with the tens of millions of Ghanaian CDs that have accrued in their private firms as transaction advisory fees for all the bond issuances. Whatever the case may be, this appetite for borrowing has proven catastrophic for our economy and has done real damage. It is well known to every economic and financial watcher that the real problem with our economy is not what we do not have it's not that we do not have enough money to spend on priority needs requiring more borrowing. It is that we have borrowed too much and a chunk of our revenue is going into servicing that debt, leaving very little for anything else. If this revenue were free and available to us, we would be in a much better place to meet many of our needs and the rigidities and their attendant consequences on all sectors would have been eased. It is evident, therefore, that the solution to the problem lies with taking the bold steps to restructure our debt, to get some relief from pumping far too much revenue into debt servicing on an annual basis and channeling the savings into priority areas that will benefit our people direct directly. The Akufado administration knows this too well, but political posturing, empty grandstanding, and a morbid fear of their own pedestrian politicking around less serious problems of the recent past have immobilized and frozen them into action, inaction which continues to run our economy aground and worsening the living conditions of our people by the day. And with this, I'm referring to their criticism of my administration when we decided to go to the IMF. They said it's only lazy governments that go to the IMF. And, I mean, the words they said in that past have come to haunt them. So one of the reasons why they're afraid to go to the IMF is that what they said in the past will uh, follow them. There appears to be an uncanny desire to kick the can down the road in the hope that it will end up at the feet of a new administration that will take over from them in 2025. The current path of reckless borrowing and piling on of debt has been discredited and cannot lead us anywhere except economic ruin and bankruptcy. Indeed, this current finance minister is on record to have said very clearly that you cannot borrow your way out of debt. These are his own words. And yet, when the circumstances uh, gave him the opportunity, that's exactly what he's doing. This government must act now and seek help to avert imminent national catastrophe. Ghanaians did not hand over the reins of power to President Akubwado to crash the ship of state through empty pride. President Addo has a responsibility to keep the ship of state afloat the same way that he came and met it. In the last few days, there has been talk from some regime actors about a potential or impending IMF program. Due to the nature and death of our economic problems, this government virtually has no other sustainable option. IMF programs come with fiscal consolidation and insistence on fiscal discipline. And that's one of the things this government lacks. They don't have fiscal discipline. And that's why they're even afraid to go into an IMF program, because the IMF will insist that you use your resources in the best possible way as, pos uh, as you can. This government has, however, so mismanaged our economy and left it in such a terrible state that fiscal consolidation alone will not do the trick. We require comprehensive debt restructuring. Fiscal consolidation is a different issue. It is prioritizing your resources, increasing your revenues, reducing your expenditures. But then that alone can't do the trick because we also have the additional burden of debt. And so how you manage the public debt 
is also an, uh, something that you must look at. We require comprehensive debt restructuring to obtain the sort of relief that will give us the fiscal space it needed to ease our plight. Any IMF program should be preceded or done jointly together with discussions with our creditors to achieve debt restructuring. Sometime last week, the President, in a speech in Brussels, lamented the non-renewal of the debt service suspension initiative. It's called DSSI. It was announced when, after the COVID to try and help countries um, with their debts that were facing high debt burdens. The DSSI was set up by G20 countries under the supervision of the World Bank and IMF and was designed to suspend the debt service obligation of countries with huge debt burdens. This was to afford them some fiscal space so that they can channel the extra resources that would otherwise have been used to service debt into more critical areas of their economies. However, we should note that the DSSI, as it was set up at the time, was not advantageous to Ghana because of the nature of our debt. Almost 80% of our debt is commercial credit. And so at the time, the DSSI was not advantageous to us because if we had signed up to the DSSI, our creditors, commercial creditors, would immediately have demanded that we pay them back their money. And government does not have that money to pay. But I, I, I just want to say that Ghana cannot afford to wait for a new common framework for debt treatment beyond DSSI before we act on a precarious debt situation. While the President is lamenting about the non-renewal of DSSI, we cannot say we're waiting for the international community to come with a new program before we begin to do something about our debt. We would have gone the Sri Lanka way long before that new program would be available. We should also note that even if those two initiatives are renewed, they will not be enough to address our problem, given how far our economy has deteriorated in the last two years and the current structure of our debt, which is heavily tilted towards commercial loans. Debt restructuring was, has therefore become unavoidable if we are to overcome the present economic problem. The President must make the big and very important call and begin the process to restructure our debts before we become like Sri Lanka, which has sunk into unimaginable economic and social crisis. For those of you who watch CNN and other news channels, you see what is happening in, in Sri Lanka. Even more importantly, the unbridled, unbridled and unsustainable borrowing must stop immediately. Like I said, they must put a moratorium on additional non-concessional borrowing. We can no longer afford to dither and fiddle while our economy heads for the precipice. The consequence of that will be too grave to comprehend. Meanwhile, it will serve the President well to use some items from the presidential toolkits in times of crisis such as this. There's a toolkit with some items in it that presidents can use when they are faced with this kind of crisis. The first is he should address the nation and explain the situation in which we are and rally the support of the citizens behind any economic program that he wants to put forward. The second is he should fire his finance minister. Well, the third is he should conduct a major shake-up of his government to remove all the many dead woods that have turned ministries into their kingdoms. And then finally he should huddle with the best brains of this country to formulate a comprehensive recovery plan for our economy. Unfortunately, even though I said some of this in my first speech at Ghana at the Crossroads, the President has refused to take any of these measures. He no longer talks to the people, no major address to the people about our current situation, no interviews with the press, and so, Definitely, I don't know when he's going to take advantage. His finance minister is his cousin. He's afraid to fire him. Or because of the relations they have, he's not inclined to do so. Many of the ministers who have superintended over ministries that are non-performing 
have some politi political links with the president and therefore it makes it impossible for him to remove them from their positions. Even when he himself can see that some of those ministers have presidential ambitions. And I mean, it should be easy for you to remove them so that they can concentrate on their presidential ambitions, but not this president. I suggested to him to do a Sinchi style forum like we did, gather all the best brains in the country to think through, because they say, Nyansai ni obako fotim. And so if you gather all the best brains and bring them together, no matter their political inclination, suggestions will come out that will help you come up with a proper fiscal consolidation policy that you can take to any multilateral institution in order that you get some relief. And so I think that it's a good time that Think Progress Ghana has come into the civil society space. You've come at a time our country is in a crisis and we wish you well.